Perfect. So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Annika, and I have the honor of being part of the Supercluster team as the Membership and Communications Coordinator. I'd like to welcome you all to today's Best Practices Workshop on midterm reporting and the claims process for our capacity building program. These workshops are intended to introduce and prepare you with the tools and knowledge to support you and your project teams. As the majority of our supercluster team is based in Vancouver, British Columbia, we would like to acknowledge that we are gathering virtually on the traditional lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Before handing things over to today's presenters, Nadia, Wade, and Jen, our goal is to have the session be engaging and informative. If at any point you have a question during the presentation, please feel free to type into the chat box and we will pause periodically after each section to address your questions in the queue. As a reminder, this call will also be recorded and we ask that all participants keep their lines muted during the presentation to avoid any feedback. We will also be distributing both this recording as well as the presentation deck following the session for you to refer back to and share with your teams. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Jen, just to do a quick introduction. Awesome. Thanks so much, Annika. Um, and so lovely to see everyone again. Most of you um, I know quite well, um, and some of you are, are, are new to me. So um, on behalf of uh, the team, welcome. And um, it's super exciting, um, I think, as we approach this um, pivotal moment, which is known as your project midterms. Um, it seems like only yesterday we were going through this MPA um, journey and there was that thing called Schedule C and these things called the MPA articles where there were these loose references to things around claims and reporting and submissions. And I think we all had that lens of, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's coming. It'll be one of these things one day. Um, and so here we are one day. Um, and so... <clears throat> Over the course of the next hour or so, um, my colleagues Wade and Nadia um, are going to be uh, guiding you through um, some of the uh, pieces uh, that will sort of help to inform what this submission um, is going to look like. Uh, and the only caveat, and I know that um, Nadia will also share this as she goes, is for um, Jack um, and for the College of the Rockies in that um, you have one extra uh, column that's going to be on your um, on your reporting in that you have an extra milestone. So um, that's just something sort of to keep in mind, but all the, uh, all the things sort of remain the same um, just as your program is a little bit longer. So we built in that extra timing. Um, if we can move to the next slide, the objective um, today um, is to really look at um, providing you with the guidance, with the support, um, the tools uh, and a forum to allow for a Q&A sort of on what that capacity building uh, reporting uh, is going to look like um, and, and some of the items that we're um, going to need to, you know, look closely at uh, in terms of compliance uh, with, with ICED um, and with our contribution agreement. Uh, and so if we take a look at the agenda over the next hour or so, uh, first and foremost, uh, we'll have a general overview of the midterm reporting um, and then have a deeper dive into the midterm uh, report uh, process as well as the form so you'll get a first-hand glance at what that looks like um, and then my colleague Wade will uh, walk you through the claim process um, and, and, and the things to consider uh, as you are preparing for that submission as well as a deeper dive into what that form is going to look like and the different inputs required um, and then have an opportunity for next steps um, Q&A uh, and throughout it as well have a chance to to discuss further. Um, so with that, um, I will hand it off to to Nadia and uh, yeah, super excited uh, that you've all been able to join today. Thanks so much. Just looking for my unmute button. So hello, everyone. I hope that you guys get as excited about Excel forms as I do. So um, I'm here. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself. So I do know some of you. I, I, I worked with uh, some of the, the teams as you guys went through the MPA process and in between. So and it's lovely to see all of you. Jen is such a fantastic ambassador for your projects. And I can not tell you that we have been, you know, our little team has been watching the capacity building project with such awe to see how you guys have done incredible things over the last short couple of months and turbulent months at that. So, 
So I'm really excited that you guys are, are hitting the midterm, excited to see the numbers and, and you know, kind of walk you through the reporting. Um, you know, it is primarily Excel based and there is like, like, like a number of things that we, we like to see. So we did want to take this opportunity to walk through that process with you guys. Um, and so that you can understand how the reports can come through. It's been a long time since the MPA was signed. It does feel like it was a different world. And so this is, this is our opportunity to do that. So in the capacity build, for the capacity building projects, what we're looking at is at the midterm point. So at the midpoint uh, that we would, we would see from you guys coming um, the, the midterm report and a second set of claims uh, that would be used to reconcile the advances that you've already received and then, and then prepare for the next tranche of, 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 um, of funding. Uh, so there, these these reports are interlinked, uh, though they have very unique purposes. And so, so the intention is to really clarify that so that you understand how it kind of fits into both project oversight uh, and in the funds management uh, for the project. So what on this slide over here, what what I've tried to do is is kind of show the trajectory of of a, of a standard project. So in your during your midterm, you may have um, you know deliverables that were completed within the midterm, you may have deliverables that um, are spanning across your project or over midterms. And really our intention isn't to see all your like full deliverable outputs, it's, it is to see how the project is progressing and how the uh, both in terms of delivery, in terms of fund uh, budget burn, and then also in, in, in project outcomes. Uh, the the second part of so your your midterm is is really like looking at at a chunk of time. I know College of the Rockies, you guys are at, at the one third mark. For everybody else, you guys are at the halfway mark. Um, and the reports are you know so right now we have the midterm report and the claim report. At the end of the project, we will have the final report and the final set of claims that will go with it. So those are the reporting requirements for you guys. In terms of timelines, and this is, you know, based off what the MPA says and, and how we are preparing for it. So your midterm ends. So we are looking at the midterm as the last day of the midterm month. So if your midterm is um, somewhere in September, you could use 30th September as your date. Uh, for a majority of our consortiums, they find it easier if it is the end of the month, primarily because the books are closing and they're able to get the numbers a lot easier. Uh, however, if you would like to keep you know, an arbitrary date within that month, feel free to let us know and then we can work with that. Um, so, so you have a little bit of flexibility of what that, what that last day, what that uh, midterm end date looks like. We are expecting the midterm report within 30 days of, of the end of the midterm. Uh, and the midterm report we're gonna go through is primarily a project progress um, report. So it's, it's, uh, it's used from the programs team to really understand and be able to articulate how well your project has moved forward, what are the key concerns, what are some of the variances, you know, in terms of, of delivery. Uh, we are looking at the claims or, you know, to be provided to us within 45 days of the midterm ends. And so while there's some overlap here, you can put your, you can, you can provide your claim um, as soon as the midterm period ends, but it will not be processed until the midterm report is received and accepted by the super cluster team. Um, the midterm report is primarily through emails and there's a lot, there's a little bit of a back and forth there. Uh, the claims and because of the sensitivity of the information, it goes through our SharePoint portal. So if you guys haven't set that up, I know Wade will talk through what the process of that will look like. So if, uh, if there, there aren't any questions, I'll, I'll sort of move to the midterm report. Okay, so what is the midterm report? So the midterm report is really, like I said before, it's, it's a way for us to understand how the project has progressed. I understand, you know, we've, we've been getting your status reports, but this is a way to really quantify that information. So we have the project progress. It looks, so that, that, that's what your delivery looks like. We wanna understand what your budget burn looks like 
what the forecast is for the remainder of the project. What are some of the outcomes and impacts that you've been able to accomplish and what, what you are planning, how, how the measurement and evaluation of those are gonna look like for the next coming of period. The report itself, so while the programs team is the primary consumer of that report and we, are, we use it, it does propagate across our organization and beyond it. So the, our finance team, as I said, or your uses the report to uh, process your funds and release the funds. So this is this is the document that they that they need to ensure that the project is meeting the strategic outcomes and that it is continuing to be on the path. And so that is part of the evidences that they require and the support that the program team needs to provide in terms of approving of approving the milestone report is an indication for them that you guys are doing work and yes, they can move forward with the process of payment. It is used by Annika and her team and her communication team to build external communication so that it, you know, if you see your project in your in the member update, if you're seeing a video about it in our in our in our um, annual report or uh, in many times, like even communications that we're doing with the ministry, it is it is this report that is parts of this report is used to create that material. And it's also used by ISET, again, by their communication teams, and also um, as a way to measure the, pro uh, the project and see how they're doing. Um, you know, like I said, capacity building has a lot of excitement around it. So, so there's, a, there's, there's, there's the keenness right now for, for um, the world to kind of see wh where we are in terms of impact and, 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 and outcomes on these projects. Uh, and, and finally, the midterm report is part of your project record. So it is subject to audit uh, and it, it is, um, you, you need to be ensuring that it, it is at, as accurate as possible. So that it is based off estimates like the MPA, but it should be a, a true reflection and that whatever you provide can be supported. Uh, and you need to, to maintain those records for at least two years uh, after the project ends. So, so those are, you know, some of the things that are outlined in the MPA as well. So how, how does the midterm report work? So the midterm report, as I said earlier, is, is primarily based on an email submission. So the programs team, so that, uh, you know, uh, so my team under the operations uh, and um, we'll be working with Jen to baseline the report. So we will, you will get a pre-populated form. So you won't be working with a blank Excel file uh, based off the MPA. And we would see that you would be, um, you would update it to, to reflect um, changes that, that occurred based off what we planned and the realities of, of, of execution. We will be sending the report to the, the project manager and the, and the project lead. It will be sent via email and it will, we will work with the projects to PM to kind of work through if there are any questions. We expect that the PM will be working with all the consortium members to get all the information. It is a project based report, so it does require collaboration and inputs from everybody. The PM will, uh, will need to then go through the governance structure and there will be a steer co-approval of the report. In this particular approval, the supercluster does, uh, does, doesn't vote on the milestone, um, sorry, on the midterm report, primarily because we see it as a project operations report and we ourselves have an acceptance process in-house that, that needs to be undertaken. So it kind of, um, undermines it if we've already vote, voted for it. So, so there won't be a vote from the super cluster, but that's standard across all our projects. Once you have uh, received a go ahead from the steering committee, you will submit it to the project team. The project team will review the report. So we will be doing that with our leadership. So our VP will be involved in it and we will be uh, looking through the question to see if there are any questions, any, any, any comments on it. And once we, that review is completed. If we have questions, we will send it back to you. If we don't, uh, we will accept the report, give you a notification, and that acceptance is a trigger for the finance team that for any reviewed claims that they are that are completed, that they can go ahead and um, move forward with processing the payments. So like I said, I'm hoping that you guys are as big Excel geeks as myself, or at least like you are willing to, to take on, <laughs> take, to fall in love with Excel as you work through these reports. So the, some general tips, and I won't go through all of them. You, you will get a chance 
to go through it through the Excel file. So some of the, you know, it is Excel. And for those of you who work um, on Macs and non PC machines, uh, you know, you, you will have to be patient with it because depending on what program you're using, it, there are behavioral things in there. It does work best with Excel 2007 or newer. Um, one of the biggest learnings is, is, and one of the, the things I would, I would like to stress is do not cut and paste. It moves the references of the formulas around and, and it, it, it will cause those horrendous hashtags, refs, and, and values and spills across your documents that usually give people heart attacks. So, so if you don't cut and paste, you'll be totally okay. Uh, just copy, paste, delete, or copy and paste values, and you should be just fine. If you do, if it does happen, we are here to support you. You know, I'll, you know, we'll work through the files and, and clean it up for you. It's not a problem, but that's always good to know. The white fields are for you guys to um, to enter your information. The blue fields are for uh, our locked fields, so they're either pre-populated or they they have formulas underneath them. The reports, the way that they're structured, you move left to right, um, and um, and and really like it's important to be. Uh, to take a little bit of time with the report and make sure that you're, you're completing each step in each tab before you move to the next one because they are there is information that's flowing across them. So if there aren't any questions at the moment, then I can move to the Excel file itself and walk you through like a demo project. So just get, bear with me as I switch screens over here. I hope the landscaping noise isn't too bad for you guys at the back, but okay, so here we go. So here's the Excel sheet. So it's made up of these of these tabs, as you can see, a number of tabs at the bottom. Hopefully, like it's it's not too small. So the first tab is the instructions. So it just gives you an overview of what we're intending on the um, on each of the tabs and a little bit about what the fields and, and what our expectations are in terms of the information that that is going to be put in there. All the gray tabs over here, so A, B, all the way to E are the input tabs, and the yellow tab here is a report tab. Um, and like I said, we it's important to move from left to right. Um, your The first tab over here, um, Jen, can you let me know if this is, or, or anybody has, if the, if the size is okay, or if you would like me to Maybe just it. zoom in a little bit, like to 120 or 130. There you go, okay. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Thank you. So the, for the midterm, so the first tab A is primarily just your information tab. It just outlines the core information about who, who are the consortium members, if there are any third party contributors. It talks through um, the contract date, the start date, what your midterms look like. So for College of the Rockies, you guys will have a third term defined over here what the major deliverables are that you're working through, and if there are any change orders or amendments that, um, that have been um, you know installed within the project and thereby changed what we had in the MPA. So, so that that change order amendment then becomes the the new baseline that we measure the project against. So, um, this information is going to be pre-populated. It has a lot of the information that is uh, primarily from the MPA or the change order. What we're looking for in terms of input, other than than just validating that the information is accurate, is that once you have your approval date from your steering committee that you just insert that over here and and that is really what we're probably the only input other than a review that is required the second tab is the work tab and this is this allows us to understand where the project deliverables are so these the the column b provides the the deliverables that we that we've already identified in tab A and sort of pulled in here, and then we're we're requesting for you to provide information regarding uh, what work was done on that deliverable. This is especially important for deliverables that are spanning multiple uh, miles, uh, terms. Uh, what is the status of it? If it has started, not started? So you know we may say, well, this one has started or you know, it was delayed or is it in track or if we're you know, in some cases ahead of schedule. And then we, you know, uh, to define what is the acceptance criteria. So that the acceptance criteria is uh, really what are the, the MVP of, of, the, uh, of the deliverable. So what are we looking from the deliverable in order to say that, it's, that it is complete? 
uh, and the acceptance criteria authority. So the authorities, what we're looking for is the organization and their title. Optionally, you can add the person's name, but we would like to understand which, which principal from which organization will be the one who will confirm the completeness of the, of the deliverable. For deliverables that are, that are completed, we expect that they will the acceptance criteria would be completed and by that it means that the accepting authority has confirmed that and you as the pm has collected that confirmation either via email or or signature or documents or whatever process you have those um the acceptance criteria and the completion of the acceptance criteria is also part of your audit and project record so while we do not ask to see it uh you should be maintaining it because we may, we may be asking for it, um, or it may be asked during an audit if if if, uh, if 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 an audit is done for the project. In terms of what we're looking for, we're looking at the uh, accumulative de delivery percentages. So uh, if you know, for in this particular case, we we can see that the need assessment is completed at hundred percent, and the acceptance criteria is also completed. However, the delivery. Um, uh, deliverable is at 70%. And we may say, well, we were behind schedule, so that's 60%. Uh, the internships, we wanted it, you know, we thought we would get at 40%, but because of COVID, we are at 35%. However, we were able to start the findings, so that's ahead of schedule and 10%. So these, you know, that, that's what we're looking for in terms of input and to see what the, with for most projects, we're assuming that by the end of term two, you're going to be hitting 100%. You can see that those numbers highlighted, and the reason that they're highlighting over here is not um, it's not an error. It, it highlights that it's different from what the MPA said or whatever the baseline is. For all of these yellow items, we are expecting that um, that you would put in a comment here that would explain to us why there is a there you know a high level comment that just explains a little bit about why it's highlighted and that's the delivery um, tab in the delivery variance tab is really like it's pulling up some information for us uh, it's letting us know what was what was planned so in this case assuming it's the mpa what was in the current report so the information that you've put in tab b and then we're looking at what is forecasted for the next term so where will the deliverable be in the next term? You can see that, there, that for the ones for delivery that we moved from 70 to 60%, we can see that there's a there's a 10%, we're 10% behind schedule. It's still considered green, you know, we, we give a 10, the, the way that those traffic lights are coded right now is that pl, pl, uh, minus 10% is green, but to, up to 25% is amber, and then beyond that it is red. So for anything that is in amber or red, we are asking that the risk of uh, the delivery variance that you just provide us like an, a sense of what, what risk it has to project outcomes. And, pro and in terms of that, what we mean is budget, um, being able to meet whatever the scope or intent or impact was or um, you know, timelines. And then, you know, what the risk is. So, you know, it could be no risk. So you may have a variance and you have a plan in place and you know that it's not going to be a risk or you can see that, oh, no, the project will be delayed. So we have like, like I said over here, we're looking for description of the risk, impact of the, on the project, if there's a mitigation strategy and if there are any other comments or, or notes that you would like to add about it. This is only required for the reds and the ambers. But if you would like to add it for something green, it, you know, it, it would be fantastic to get as much input as possible on, on these ones. So this is the one, this is the probably the tab that everybody's kind of been waiting for. So this is this is on the budget spend. And this really tells us like how you have been spending the budget. And I know for many of you, as you went through the contracting, you learned a whole new language, uh, you know, based on, uh, on our like co-investment guidelines. So there's an entire super cluster speak, you know, around eligibility of cost and ineligibility of cost. And, and, and um, so our, our intention over here is to really try to understand how you have moved through your budget, different participants, uh, funding, uh, any funders that were part of your contract, how, how, you know, those fundings have come through or not, if there are any, and what the forecasting looks like. 
So for the current period, so for the first midterm report, what, we're, we're, we, what we would like to see is uh, what are some of the costs that you have incurred? So if in, so the information that you're going to get in the baseline version is going to have the information based on the MPA. So we may say, well, because of COVID, you know, we have, we, we had to like go down in cost. So we went down to 140,000 and that 20,000 we're actually going to just put in here and, you know, our, our forecast for next month, is, uh, next cycle is going to just look a little bit higher. Alternatively, you may say, well, no, I, I did all my work. I was able to do it. And the forecast for the following season, you know, following term is going to be lower. Um, and ideally, what, you know, what column F is telling us is what is the variance amongst on the overall project, on the overall budget that that was that was provided for that for that specific consortium member, if you have a negative number, that means that you have overspent. If you have an under a, a positive number, it means that you are underspent. Uh, if your budget is intact, we would expect to see that you would in your forecast you would put in whatever the variance is, and this column would be zero. If you are on track to be underspending, then we would expect to see that number there and, and a comment to just kind of explain to us. Uh, you know, it may be that you underestimated, you overestimated the support that the consortiums needed. You may have, um, you know, overestimated, you know, your own costs for, you know, management or, or, or content creation. So whatever it is, it, it, you know, just give us a, just an, an understanding of what that variance is indicating. Uh, on the second table over here, we're looking to see any funders that were identified in your contract. For most of us, for most of the project, it looks like it's going to be either my tax. Uh, in, in some cases, it was uh, industry funding that was going to move between organizations, could have been a Microsoft grant. So there, there's, there's a couple of them that were part of the contract. So we just wanted to understand how those fundings went. Did you receive the funding in this term or not? Has it been moved forward? you know, and, 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 and what the impact that would have on the, on the, um, on your project. Table C3 is telling us what are the total net commitments. So the cost that you incurred plus minus any funding that you receive or gave. And this is the plan with, this, this is the number upon which we are calculating your, your co-investment. So this is a calculated field, uh, and just a number for you to take a look at, but it's, a, it, 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 the system is going to calculate it for you. Table C4 is probably the one, the most um, important table for you get for, for, for all of us over here because it talks about what is the distribution of the co-investment from Supercluster that you are expecting from us. So it's got, unlike the other ones, it's got three columns. So it's got the advance. So that's the 50% advance that most of uh, that the organizations got. The second tranche is for the 30%, so that's the reconciliation um, up to up to 80% of the co-investment amount is in advance too. And then at the end is what will be the final reconciliation at the end of the project. So based off what you're going to tell us, uh, this is just an estimate. The, the final numbers are subject to review by our finance team and, and depending on the eligibility of the cost, then you know, the, the whole review that will be done. So the, this number is just intended to provide an estimate. So it's not a, it's not a confirmation in any way of, of what you're providing. Uh, and the final table over here is an optional table. And really what we're looking for over here is what is, uh, if you've made any payments, so, so within the, the super cluster funds that you receive, if you paid them out to other consortium members, if that is the agreement within the contract. So in some of the, in some of the projects, this is, this is an invalid, this, this situation doesn't exist in others it does it is for us to under, to ensure that all consortium members are meeting their obligations is particularly the project lead in, in making the payments to other consortium members so so that is uh, the budget spend table in terms of expectations and the accuracy of the numbers we're looking uh, for accuracy within 10 to um, within 10 percent of what will be in the claim amount. There's no, there, we are not expecting these numbers and the claim numbers to be exactly the same, uh, but we do expect it to be a, a strong estimate of what, what we will come in the claims. If your estimates are, are you know, 15, 20% off, 
there is there is a um, most likely what is going to happen is that as we review the claims process against the this uh, midterm report we will come back and we may ask for an amendment to the report and that whole process to kind of go through so just just to kind of set the expectations in terms of accuracies of numbers over here so before I, i'll pause here if there's any questions otherwise you guys can you can mull over them now fantastic okay so for the the tab d we are asking that the cost that you are providing in tab c so on tab c table C1, so the first table, so the cost that, that, that are being cost of work that is provided here, that we that you can provide a breakdown of these costs by categories. Uh, so this information is used uh, particularly by for ISAID reporting. So they'd like to understand how the cost breakdown um, and how those costs are, are done, especially in terms of forecasting. So um, you know, we are looking for them to be broken down by category. So that's salary and wages, consultants and subcontractors, equipment, materials, and other costs. So travel, um, if you have like, uh, you know, I don't know, I can't think of any other, there's no DCC, but if there was like, this would come over here and other costs that, that don't fit in those categories. Um, what we have at the bottom over here is a little check to help you so that you don't have to flip between the two, two tabs all the time. So because we changed those numbers, we can see that uh, in tab C, we had provided 140, but what we have here is 160. So we, if once we, and we can see there's a variance of 20 over here. Once we fix those numbers to match what we had changed on the other tab, this will become zero. And that means that you have a balanced, um, table here, these yellow highlights will also go away. So let's do that because OCD in me is not a fan of those little yellow lights. <laughs> so, so we are, um, so that's, that's the report at the end of it. So you, for every consortium member, we are asking for that breakdown to be provided to us. Um, and at the end, we have a total and the total is again, a calculated field, field, mostly just so that everybody can see how the numbers have come over, come down in terms of categories and how everything is kind of shaken out now that we have a live budget that we're working with. And the final data input slide is our KPI scorecard. Uh, and this is probably the one that both the communications team and ISED are the most excited about, as is our super cluster um, leadership. So the, uh, most, a lot of the questions that Jen and myself, who, you know, all of us who are looking after projects, get asked about are usually questions that, that are answered over here. This is again at a project level, so not at the project lead level, so, so it does require coordination. The first section of it is the project overview. So we're, what we're looking for is a description of the project. So the, some of this we will have filled out for you. You guys have already provided a lot of this information as part of the communications and announcements that we had done. Uh, but uh, the expectation would be that as the project has moved, if things have happened, you have more, more information, you can add that over here. The idea is to make this simple, but, but to really showcase your project, understanding that if you, if you, you are hearing about your project from the, from the, from the government or from, on one of Sue's uh, interviews, this is, this is where she's getting, this is where the information is built out of. So we wanna get, we wanna be able to showcase and highlight your project over here. So we have a description, the project statement, impact statement, uh, we would like to understand what are the key accomplishments of the project. So not, you know, not necessarily all the project management, like we delivered on time. We want to, we want to know what is the big headline regarding the accomplishments so far, right? And what are the, what are the things that, that we should get excited about, about your project's accomplishments. The second section here is about project partners. Um, this is again something that 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 has a lot of focus. So not only the consortium members, uh, which are in blue, and these are these are pulled from tab A, um, and we would like to know what their role is and what are their core activities, but also their other participants on the project. So do you have advisors and observers that are not part of your MPA but are critical to how your project is moving forward? You may be working with other non-for-profits with other technology in industries that are providing inputs and insights to, to work on your project. They may be government bodies that are working with them. So we would just like to understand who those parties are and, and, and what is their role on the project. And it may also, yes. 
Um, to what level of materiality? Um, we just signed 45 um, subcontractor agreements for SMEs, trainers, mentors, things yeah. like that. So to what degree do you want this uh, detail? So if you have, I mean, it's, it's rare that we have so many, but like, so, so in your case, you can group them up. So let's say if you have like uh, industry partners, you say, you can say industry partners, subcontractors, and then you can put in, in member activities, you can just list their names out. So you don't have to create a row for each one of them just to give us a sense of who they are. Yeah. So I hope that, that, that would not, that would be okay. In, in the case of your projects, are there any commercial outputs? So I know in many of the consortium, when we initially started the MPA conversations, we didn't know what if they would be commercial outputs, but if they're commercial outputs, if you're gonna be uh, commercializing any curriculum that you're developing processes, any training material, maybe you created a platform. If you have any, we would love to know what those are. That is the core part of our supercluster DNA is to is, is supporting commercialization. And while it's not um, the core for the capacity building project, it's great to, to be able to see and recognize those. Then we have the activity benefits. So, you know, environmental impacts, benefits to Canada, benefits to research, and if there are other benefits, so just to provide us with some language that supports that. As part of the economic benefit, we would like to understand how many new jobs were created out of the project. So this includes the direct job. So if you are if you're doing placements and internships, and so all of those would be counted as created jobs. Maintain jobs are people that were already part of your organization that are working on the pro that were assigned to the project and working on the project. And by rehired, we mean any any folks that used to work for you, but because of the project, you brought them back into your organization, whether that's for a short-term contract or back on a full-time position, or you converted them from a contractor to full-time. So those will be identified here. We understand that there will be overlaps between those numbers, but we're, those are, those are the, the numbers that we're tracking uh, for economic impact. If there's any specific capacity building that you did in-house for your team to be able to work on the project, deliver on the project, um, the box over here, row 58 is where we would like to see that. The, for the gender and diversity benefits, uh, we would like to understand, uh, you know, women, women in leadership, if there's any indigenous personnel or organizations involved and, and as, as a means of tracking. Uh, in terms, you know, as, as a, as, you know, Connected to the commercial outputs piece, we have the IP strategy. So in your Schedule D of your MPA, if you have anything identified in foreground IP, we would love to see if you've been able to, what work has been done towards creating, generating, protecting um, those, those IPs. Uh, and this is just a, you know, a little table for us to kind of speak to it. It may, it may mean that the IP manager comes and asks more questions. Um, as you will recall, in the MPA, we do talk about the IP registry. So subject to confidentiality or, or trade secret or protection, uh, your foreground IP may become part of that, which, you know, which is intended to ignite the ecosystem and hopefully create a buzz around like uh, creations that have come out of the project. If there's any work that you are, any relationship building or uh, commercial activities or that, that are taking place outside Canada because of the project, we would love to know what those are and what they look like. So just a high level, not, we don't need specific, you know, to go into too much detail, just the sense that the global life, you know, are we, are we moving to a global platform or not, you know? So that, that's also part one of, one of the key outcomes of the, the super cluster is to, ensure that Canada is on a global stage recognized as you know, the innovators that we are. And then we have the final, final tab, which speaks to the project impact that, that are planned. And this, uh, these, this is in your schedule E of your MPA, and this is how we're tracking them. If you find that you, you are deviating from what we have, so you may be uh, overreaching the targets, or you shifted your targets, COVID changed the plan, uh, one of your technology leadership uh, you know, partners or your, your technology or industry partners kind of, you know, shifted, you know, changed expectations. This is a great time to kind of create, to, to add some of the details around that and adjust it. If you have done a midterm review, you yourself understand what those numbers look like. We'd love to know what those look like. You know, if your target was to do 60% women 
intern placement, but you've reached 40%, it's still, it's still something that we would love to celebrate with you to let us know through this report. So that's the KPI report. Uh, and then at the last one is really just, um, it's, it's a various report and its intention is to allow you uh, as the PMs or the principals of the, of the project to really see how the budget is moving. Uh, it, the report itself just takes a look at what you provided at tab C and, and compares it against what is ever in the baselines of the MPA or the, of the change order or the amendment. It, we have given you the option to look at the cost difference. So this is the absolute cost difference. Um, you know, so we can see overspending of 100,000 in, in midterm one for the project lead, but that is adjusted in, in the, you know, the, the next term. In the similar way, you would see, you know, in, in terms of percentages, what it looks like. So while we can see that their percentages changes within the terms, the net percentage is okay. And then we also have the accumulated um, spending of the budget. So the project lead, we can see jumps from 35% to 100%. So this, this should, you know, they, they, uh, it should point to questions that, 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 that you should be asking yourselves in terms also, that is it feasible for us to to hit, you know, to do a 65% budget spend in that period? Are we, you know, is it overestimating? So the intention is really to help those conversations both um, within the consortium and within the super cluster also. And 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 re that's pretty. That's it. That's the midterm report. So um, hopefully, didn't scare you guys too much with that. <laughs> and then. Let me go back to the presentation now. Okay. So just in terms of a checklist, so again, I won't go through it. We've just kind of gone through it. It's important that any variances and high, you know, uh, that are have comments and for you provide us with the context. It minimizes the back and forth if we understand it. Uh, and uh, use the comments to tell us as much of your story as possible. You know, numbers are fantastic. I love. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a numbers and Excel girl, but I, I totally appreciate um, the fact that they're they're not the whole story. So let us know what they are. Uh, so a little bit about the just to confirm again. So the midterm report confirms the work that you've done and forecasts what it, what is coming up in the upcoming terms. Um, for the midterm report is due 30 days after the completion of the midterm period. So if you are, you know, you can coordinate with Jen to, to know how, how to set up the, you know, if you want to change the, the, the end date or you want, if you need more time, let us know and, and we can see if we can, if we can provide some flexibility of that as well. Uh, in, do work with your consortium. The information is intended to be for the whole project and not just the lead. So you will need inputs from everybody and prepare for that. Generally, we have found uh, that it takes uh, about five days for data collection, depending on the strength and the relationships and with and the health of the consortium. But generally, five days. If you once you put out the ask, there will be a couple of reminders. There will be folks who will who will read the email and then say, oh my God, this is a lot and then forget about it. So you do need to kind of work through those. Uh, as the PM set aside two to five hours straight for you to kind of go through that report, make sure that you, uh, you see how everything flows together. It does require a little bit of time to ensure that everything is, 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 is kind of fits together and, and you feel comfortable taking it to the steering committee. Once it goes to the steering committee and you get the approval, um, I think the focus for the steering committee should really be tab B1. So this is for the PMs as you're walking with them is tab B1 to understand what the variances look like, um, the cost variance tab and the KPI tab. So those are the ones that we expect the leadership to really be focused on and be able to, um, to understand what, what that means for them as an organization and for them as part of the consortium. And so that's, that, that's my section. So um, unless there's any questions, I will now pass it on to Wade. No questions? There you go. I do have one uh, question. So, and, and maybe this is, uh, this is more for Jen, but um, logically, our, our midterm would, would have been at the end of August. Um, we started accepting 
participants into W Venture uh, for the beginning of September. And according to our MPA, that was really, that was the, the, the midterm of our, of our report, but we're already halfway through September. And if we called it the end of August, then uh, the clock is, is half done on getting the, uh, the progress report in. Um, advice? Well, we can, I mean, I will definitely need to talk to, to, to work with Jen on that, but we could, we could take it as, as September instead of August. Like, I don't know, I don't know what the exact date is in the contract. I believe it's, you know, it, it might be um, end of September, but we, we can, in working with Jen, I think the best way would be to kind of work through the, what that date will look like. If it is August and we say we recognize that it's August and we recognize that, okay, we have started this process with you now, like post August, we will definitely be <laughs> definitely be extending some sort of flexibility. Yeah, yeah. For sure. And knowing that there were some shifts and some of the delays in getting started and stuff. So that's something that we yeah, communicated sort of early on. Um, and yeah, the flexibility there, because we, yeah, things got shifted a bit with, with some of the um, advisory work and, and, and COVID delays and things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I assume there's no many, no more questions there. So I'm kind of happy to jump in. Um, hi everyone. Uh, thanks Nadia for that, that handover. Um, to introduce myself, I work in the finance and accounting team as the director of, um, uh, as the director of finance at Digital Supercluster. Uh, before we get going, I just want to say that as part of the finance team, we are super proud to work with all of you. And um, I, I hope you see us as a, as a support extension of the, uh, the projects team. Um, our team is excited to be at a stage where we can start processing your project advance reconciliations and claims. And we do hope to make it a seamless process for you. Uh, so today we will just give you a high level overview of what is a project claim uh, or advance reconciliation and to give you a sneak peek into the different templates. Uh, so maybe Nadia, next slide. Um, all right, so, so first, uh, wait, that's the midterm report. It's a recap. There you go. <laughs> um, so first, what are project claims? Um, so Digital Supercluster co-invests on eligible project expenses using the co-investment rate set in the MPA, so that's standard. Um, and the project claim process facilitates the reimbursement and reconciliation of the incurred project-related expenses. Um, so where is the, where's the claim form template and claim-related documents? Um, we've tried to create a one-stop shop for all uh, claim-related information and documents uh, within our SharePoint website. Uh, to get access to the SharePoint website, uh, please contact your digital supercluster project lead um, and provide him or her with your full name, title, and email address. Uh, within SharePoint, you'll be able to download all claim-related templates and guides, and also, in so doing, upload your claim-related uh, claim documents. Uh, note that we take confidentiality very seriously at, at Digital Supercluster. Only you and your approved staff will have access to the project's folder. Uh, note also, even at Digital Supercluster, only the finance team can access the folders. Um, so when do I submit a claim? So following the midterm uh, period end. Payment will only be processed following the submission and acceptance of the midterm report. So you can submit your claim as soon as you want, as soon as you're ready. But the finance team is only going to start working on the, on the processing and approving it once we receive the approved midterm report. Um, so that's we often get questions on that. Um, so maybe next slide. So just very briefly, we'll go over the claims uh, process itself. Um, first, you need to request access of the claim SharePoint website or portal. Um, Afterwards, you will receive an access confirmation email from Digital Supercluster, which will include a link to your project claims folder. Um, and in a few minutes, I'll give you a quick view of what the SharePoint site uh, looks like. Uh, if you have any issues um, accessing the website, just let us know. Um, we've just brought someone in to help with any IT issues uh, with regards to SharePoint. 
Um, next step, you upload your claim and supporting documents to SharePoint. Um, as a best practice, after you have uh, made this upload, please send an email to Digital Supercluster, um, either to the projects team or to the finance team, just letting us know that the files have been uploaded. Um, this is just to make sure that no uploads uh, slip through the cracks of our review. Uh, next, during our claim review, we will contact you if we need any clarifications on your claim documents. Um, remember, our mandate is to get funds to you and to, and, to, and to make sure that you have filled in the form correctly so when we give it to our funders, there's no reconciliation later. Um, once all has been reviewed and clarified, uh, we will obviously then approve the claim. And finally, with the big dollar happy sign, uh, payment will be processed to your account. Um, one common question we get is in terms of uh, timeline. How long does it take us to process it? Uh, so typically speaking, once you've uploaded your forms, Supercluster commits um, to a two to three week minimum in the claim review. Uh, we often beat that. That's just, I'd rather set a, um, a generous timeline and uh, kind of improve on that. Once it's been approved, we, by our MPA standards, we have within 45 days to release the funds to you. Um, that's very long. Uh, we've generally kind of done that within a week, um, but we do just want to clarify just in case there's issues delivering a check. Uh, we try to commit to that 45 days. Um, now, I mentioned earlier, we talked about a SharePoint site. and It's, it's a kind of key point to um, our claims process. So on the next slide, we can go over the, um, the site. All right, so the claims uh, SharePoint portal, um, you'll notice that there are once you get access, you'll go straight, you should get access to, this is the screen that you will see. Um, there are two folders available to you. One being the templates and guides folder. This is where you can download all project claim material. And the other folder is your project folder. So typically, whatever the name is your project, that should be the title in there. And this is where you'll be able to upload your templates and supporting material. We do have certain controls in that, so please note that if you suddenly find you can't upload any information, just double check which folder you're in. That often is the case of why you can't upload the information. Um, uh, now, uh, big one is the templates and guides folder. So let's go into that one, just so you can review what's inside it. So next slide. Great, so this is just a, a simple screenshot of what you will find. Um, so, Starting from the very top, you've got the co-investments, funds, transfer, and information form. Uh, this is to get your banking information. We need to pay you. We, don't, we need to find out what your information is for us to give you those funds. Note that as a control, um, you cannot email any banking information to Supercluster. It has to be through SharePoint. And that's just to kind of maintain that we're holding your information as secure as possible. Uh, next is the Digital Supercluster Co-Investment Claim Guideline. Uh, this just is an overview of guidelines to follow um, that you would have received and, and gone through when you signed your MPA. Uh, we do try to update this every now and again, just to make things more clear for everyone, but that's available to you. Next in the, uh, in the big red box, um, you've got the, the claim form. So what I'd say here is um, what's important is you'll look notice is the, uh, the version 2020.05. As a best practice, every time you're trying to do a, uh, an advanced reconciliation, please just check the SharePoint site just in case there's an updated version. Um, generally speaking, it's almost, almost the same between versions. We've got this down pretty well. Um, we do allow older versions to be submitted. There's no restrictions there. But nine times out of 10, it's just because we found an easier way for you to process your claim, an easier way for you to put your information in. And you can simply just move and, and copy information from one form to the other. It's, we, we try to simplify it as much as we can. Um, next is a super cluster claim checklist. So this is pretty new. Um, you don't have to provide this when you submit your claim or advanced reconciliation. It's, re it's really just a guide to answer the question, as the project lead, what should I be looking for when I'm gathering the different claims from the other consortium members? You know, should, we, should I be checking if this is eligible, non-eligible? Have they filled in the section correctly? This is just to give you a guide. It's, it's not exhaustive at all, um, but we're just trying to find ways that we can support you a bit better. So you, you're more than welcome to submit that with your claim, but it's not a requirement at all. 
Uh, next is the capital expenditures template. Um, so key thing with the capital expenditures template is that uh, all capital expenses greater than a million dollars needs prior approvals from Supercluster. So this is a form that helps to facilitate that approval. Um, in similar setting, foreign costs, um, besides for a few exceptions, most foreign costs needs approval from Supercluster um, before the expense is incurred. So this form will help facilitate that. And the last one is a wage timesheet. So the timesheet is, um, you don't have to use this, this template. You can use any template that you've got, but just because we received a lot of questions of what supporting material do I need to provide to, uh, on wages and what should it look like? So typically what we need is um, when you provide a claim for wages, we don't require um, the physical payroll that we got approval not to, not to be required. What we do need though is formal timesheet. I say a formal timesheet, if you have a system, um, a formal system like Ceridian that gives you the amount of worked hours and you can, you can get that to us as long as you sign the bottom of it, that's perfectly fine. For a lot of companies, you don't normally have a formal timesheet um, and you don't know how to give us the number of worked hours. So this template just kind of helps answer a lot of those questions for you. Most important thing is at the bottom of it, there's an attestation section uh, for all timesheets. We need to see an attestation that shows who is signing it, what is their title, um, yeah, and the date that it's been signed. So that is a key, that's the, uh, the SharePoint portal. Um, I think that's the main one. So at this point, we could potentially move to the Excel. So I think we've teased you quite a lot with what uh, the claims template actually looks like as well. And again, um, I'm also a bit of an Excel nerd, so I'll join Nadia and that, that team and we'll get a team t-shirt on that. Um, so while I move and I take over the screen to go to the Excel, uh, we can definitely take some questions if needed. And just as you're moving Wade um, to the Excel, uh, after once we finalized all the MPAs, pretty much everyone in attendance today has got access to SharePoint. So it's a good idea just to double check um, that they you can. Um, and for those that haven't yet to notify me. So thanks, Jack, um, for the for the email. We'll get everyone added, but um, just contact me directly for those of you that uh, that, that can access. Great. Yeah, that's good. Thanks for that, that context. Um, any other questions? No questions? I don't see any hands up. All right, so um, before we get going at the claim site with this uh, claims template, a couple of key points to bring up. This is not just a once off workshop for all of you. Um, definitely, if you need support on how to uh, fill this claim form in, just contact us, we're more than happy to work with you. Um, you always have that support on, not just from the projects team, but also from the finance team. Secondly, that, um, you know, the, ma the main mandate for us is to help you get funds approved. And while you're going through this claims template, if you find an area that you're struggling with, then you know, and you have an idea to improve it, just let us know. We're happy to work with you to make sure that it gets improved. Um, we'll never say we're perfect and there's always ways to do things better. Um, and so if you do have any ideas, please just let us know. Uh, all right, so let's go through the claims template. Now, uh, in the essence of time, I'm going to give a very high level overview. Uh, I don't want to go into too many big details, um, but just mainly some best practice items. So you'll notice there's roughly about 11 tabs at the bottom of the claim form. Um, the very first one being the instructions. So big thing to note is very similar to the, uh, the midterm report. Everything you see in blue is locked. Um, there's formulas built in there, so don't try to um, put the information in there. Uh, most things in white is open for you, um, and that's where we'll be able to fill in information. Um, at the very beginning, there's a checklist. These are things just to make sure that you have done and completed before handing it to us. So just going over very quickly, um, I have read and understood the co-investment guidelines. Very important because you need to know what's eligible, non-eligible. Um, and if everything's clean, it's very easy for us to um, approve the, um, the claim and get funds to you as fast as possible. Next is I have populated the claim template with all project related expenses um, and differentiated correctly. Uh, I'm seeking co-investment only on eligible expenses. All foreign costs are eligible expenses or have been pre-approved for co-investment. Um, co and again, this goes back to that, um, that, that foreign cost form that we noticed in SharePoint. 
And very similarly, the same thing for capital expenditures. Um, I have disclosed all other government funding. Um, so if you're receiving funding from my tax, uh, there's a section here called other government funding. You put those expenses in there. Obviously, it's not an eligible expense for co-investment, so we need to have that separation. Um, I have disclosed all other government funding. Yeah, we said that. Uh, all expense uh, supporting documents have been uploaded to SharePoint Claims website. So what is what supporting documents do you need to give me? Um, you'll find that in the co-investment guidelines, just very high level. We talk about exp uh, other expenses, uh, subcontractors, anything over $500 we need to see an invoice um, or receipt uh, for, for timesheets we need um, that's got to do with wages um, but yeah check the co-investment guidelines uh, next digital supercluster has my latest banking information we need to get your information um, remember it has to be through SharePoint um, that's the only way you can obviously get the funds to you and lastly a senior officer has signed the project claim attestation so when you do the attestations we need to see someone that uh, an officer of the company that um, to sign it. And that's, it's a big check for us. And we, we're pretty strict on that. Um, all right. So the next tab, let me go a little bit in. I, can, I realize it's probably a bit small. Um, first tab is the summary. Uh, and again, I'm going to be very, give a very high level view of all these different tabs. Uh, in the summary, uh, the only section you really fill in is section 1A. And it's pretty key to get this right because this helps facilitates the rest of the form. So in here, you'll put your, your, uh, the member name. Uh, for you, it's going to be obviously the project lead over here. Uh, what's the name of the project? Uh, member type. So if you're a industry, post-secondary, other government institution. Um, form type. This is the most important section for capacity building. So we've tried to, again, create a form that can be used in our other programs, such as technology leadership. So I'm not sure if some of you are involved in it. And for our capacity building and also our COVID program. So for you, you'll notice there's two sections here, project claim, advanced reconciliation. So if, if you're doing a normal project claim, let's say with our technology leadership program, you select this. For you guys in capacity building, you receive an advance upfront. So what you're really doing is you have doing a reconciliation on that advance that you received. Why that's important is based on that box, it opens up certain other sections in the form which would not normally be there. Uh, everything else is pretty straightforward. Uh, you have a section here for what for you, what milestone this is. This will be you. It's milestone one. It's the first time you, you are submitting a, um, a claim. Uh, the advance received, how much you got, and the super classic investment that needs to match what is in your MPA. Um, and then obviously the dates, the, the period that this classifies on. So a question happened earlier, what dates can I put into a claim form? Just making sure that you put the dates there accurately. Um, we do check that against all your invoices. The next section, very important, is the list of participants. So if we just put a member name of Smile, you'll notice that Smile becomes the project lead. Uh, you need to put the other members and participants that have project claims in over here. Uh, section 1B, it's automatically filled in based on what you do in the other tabs. Um, same as 1C, it's automatically filled in. The big thing with section 1B is you'll notice that nice and super cluster, um, super cluster colors at the bottom right, is how much super cluster co-investment your expenses have earned you. Remember, you try to match that as close as you can to what you got advanced. Uh, based on what you fill in the form, it'll tell you if there's any variance between what you received in, in the, as an advance versus what you're actually reconciling. Um, sorry, I'm trying to do this pretty quickly, just looking at the time. Uh, next is wages. Um, uh, so very high level, let me zoom in. Just let me know if I need to go any, any bigger, maybe there. Um, very first section is important is participation company. So one of the questions we got before, uh, and it wasn't, it's only recently been solved is when, when a project lead is putting this together, how is this project lead be able to track whose expenses are what? So here, based on what you filled in earlier, you'll put in whose expenses it would be. Um, so those will be automatically generated for you. Uh, next, uh, employee name. Uh, as a best practice, please make sure the employee name matches the supporting documents, i.e. the timesheet. Really, really important to have those name match. Um, job description uh, in column D, what you need to make sure is that we're not looking for this person is an associate. What we're looking for is a job description that is project related. We need to know what title or role this person had specifically that is project related. Uh, next section, which we've got a lot of questions on, is this rate one, rate two. So 
what happens if an employee has done exceptionally well and midway through the claim period, you got a bonus, you got a raise. How now can you mark what is expense? Because remember, it's as expense have been incurred and actuals. So what if you need to now get the, the, um, the amount of hours and the rate for before the promotion and then the hour and rate after the promotion. So this facilitates those two different um, uh, multiples on the person's payroll. Uh, there's a section there on benefits, put that in, and it automatically be calculated in total salaries and benefits. Um, I think that's, I'm gonna move on from here. It's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, again, just please make sure the most important thing for me is make sure the name matches the timesheets. It's really important. Uh, next, moving into subcontractors. So relatively straightforward. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time here. Um, again, same thing. You've got a section in front here that allows you to give you a drop down menu of the whose expense that is for. My computer's slowing down a little bit. Yeah. Um, subcontractor name important. We we need to have a matching principle. So when you have an invoice, please make sure that invoice name, the title of the company, matches what you put in the claim form. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much details. Uh, key things just in terms of best practices is one, we do always separate taxes from um, the invoice itself. Because remember taxes is a ineligible expense. We do not co-invest on, on, on taxes. So we do separate it. Uh, the second big thing, and it's really just to kind of help us is column L, title of supporting documents. So you're gonna have, let's say a whole bunch of subcontractors uh, expenses. We need, and if it's over $500, um, of course, we need to have that invoice. So when we do our check, if you give us the title of where that supporting document is, it helps us to find that specific document. Um, it really just, it's, it's to help us out. Uh, travel, just on a very high level. I don't want to go into too many details. Remember travel expenses as an eligible eligibility. It has to match the Canada's National Joint Travel Directive. Um, it has, it's very specific on it's, it's a huge document, but it's very specific on how much you can charge for daily rates and meals and hotels, um, only economy costs for short flights, no business class. Um, it's pretty straightforward. I don't want to go into too many details. Uh, things to note as well is we do have a section for foreign currency um, so, and the rates that was used. Uh, so please be reasonable and, and try match it to your actual credit statements because um, we do look for actuals. Uh, and again, you've got the section on column U, title, supporting documents, help us find that specific document. Uh, other, other eligible expenses, pretty straightforward as well. Um, I don't want to go into time here. The only thing that's unique to other eligible expenses is it's really to try, remember, it's try to capture expenses which are not the, 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 the most common ones, being wages, subcontract, and travel. As you'll notice, there's a section here that has a drop-down menu. Um, that allows you to select what kind of expense it is. I think this is pretty small. Um, so you can see it's equipment, materials, uh, dissemination costs, uh, capital expenditures, and things like that. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, next is discounted cash cost. So some of you uh, in the previous um, def uh, definition was in-kind. Remember we changed in-kind to be now called discounted cash costs. I, that was a, it's a bit of a rabbit hole. I don't want to go down that too much. Um, but this is the section that you'll fill in your discounted cash costs. Remember here, what's unique is um, we look at proof. You know, what are you giving us uh, to support your DCC, discounted cash costs? Um, and here, uh, there's a section on uh, description of the DCC. What is it? Just so that we, and we obviously we'll check the MPA to make sure it's fine. And the last section right at the end, which is just for this area, is justification for fair market values. So, in our guidelines, we gave three potential ways to do your fair market value, uh, fair market value evaluation um, of DC, DCC. So this just highlight which method you have selected. Um, other government funding, just very quickly. Um, this is where you put information on if you receive funding from my tax, you know, let us know how much that is. So obviously it goes towards your total project costs, but obviously we don't co-invest that amount. So it, just make sure you fill this in. Uh, ineligible expenses. If you do have in any ineligible expenses, um, you can put this information in. 
note we right now we do not require any supporting materials so no invoices or, or um, receipts for ineligible ineligible costs uh, with the disclaimer that if there is an audit we're able to um, you will need to provide that information um, and that supporting material uh, but otherwise it's, it's pretty straightforward uh, non-industry um, so let's say you're a university um, and you're not receive and you're not receiving any co-investment um, but you'd like to put down your costs. Uh, a typical example is some universities have overhead, which obviously we don't really co-invest on anyway, but they want that to be represented in this form. This area allows them to submit that. The last tab, which is the most important, uh, is the attestation. So on first glance, and let me go in a bit, uh, you'll notice that the attestation, the first area, looks almost exactly the same as your summary tab. Um, it, it's, it's virtually identical. What is the reason for that? Uh, it's because it's, we're obviously trying to automate this, make this very easy for you to submit. Um, what is different though, is right at the bottom, you have an area here uh, where you fill in your attestation. So we have a quick statement for you guys to, you'll need to read and, and make sure that what you're signing is, is something that you approve on. Uh, let me go in a little bit more. Um, Put in the signature, name, title of officer, company name, uh, and fill this in. If there's any information that you're sharing with us and we require additional working paper, so a typical example is your discounted cash cost. You got the supporting material, but there's numbers all over the show. It's really good practice to give us a worksheet that, that explains how you got your calculations. Anything like that, by all means, you're welcome to copy this attestation and put that in there and sign with it. Um, you can use this as a guideline for anything that you need to sign um, that you wanna make as an official document for Supercluster. Um, that was, with much excitement, the, a very high level view of the claims template. Um, so I'm happy to kind of stop sharing and, and hand it over to the rest of my team. And I think at this point, we'll also um, answer any questions. I'm the guy with all the questions. <laughs> Any problem inserting new rows if required? Um, no, there's this. I think we've created enough rows that you won't need to. Uh, if you do, just make sure it's in the middle of the document. Because remember, right, if we do any filtering, the top and the end has formulas built into it. Um, but it, that shouldn't be a problem um, for some sections. Yeah. So, for example, you should be able to do it within travel. But if you were obviously in a summary page, you won't be able to insert any rows. I was thinking of subcontractor, my uh, problem with 45 subcontractors. <laughs> um, yeah, so right now, there's a fair amount. You've got, so. Oh, looks good, okay, all right. Up to 100, so yeah. Get on you if you've got 100 subcontractors, sure. No worries there. <laughs> do it, Rob, don't do it. <laughs> Don't accept the challenge. <laughs> Anything else? Silence. I, silence just means that I've done a good job. So I'm giving myself a pat on the back for that. So thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing. It is fantastic being able to um, share this guide with you. By all means, please contact us if you have any questions. Um, and if you have any issues on, on the form itself, we're happy to, to help. And that's it for me. Oh, we need the recap. Uh, we can skip the recap. Uh, that we've gone through most of these items. All right. So thank you so much to both Wade and Nadia for going through those the claims and midterm reporting. Um, so before we close the workshop, we just wanted to reiterate a few key takeaways. Um, so firstly, that collaboration is a really critical factor in your project success. Um, timely and accurate project reporting enables the realization of impactful project outcomes. Um, so the project manager is really at the heart of coordinating information and gathering this all and submitting the reporting and claims on behalf of your consortium. And finally, the supercluster team is here to support you and your project team. Um, we really are an extension of your team and are an available resource to guide and support your project success.
So thank you all so much for taking the time to join today's workshop. Um, as we said earlier, we'll be providing all of these resources and references in the follow up email, which will happen later today. Um, thank you to Jen, Nadia and Reid for putting together and leading this presentation. We hope that you found this session informative and that it serves as an introductory guide as you work through these reporting and claims. Um, and just a quick reminder, if you have not already already registered, we are hosting an event with Minister Baines next Tuesday. Um, and we would love if you could join the discussion. Um, it'll feature him and some of our members. And I'll include that registration link in the follow up email as well. Um, and so if we don't have any further questions, thank you all so much for joining today.